Hello and welcome. Today, I will whisper to you about a complex and fascinating chapter in medieval history, the Fourth Crusade. Unlike its predecessors, which were launched with the intent of reclaiming the Holy Land from Muslim control, the Fourth Crusade took an unexpected and controversial turn. What began as a campaign to retake Jerusalem ended in the sack of Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire, a Christian city. The events of the Fourth Crusade are filled with intrigue, betrayal, and the consequences of both ambition and miscalculation. In this episode, we'll delve into how this crusade was born out of a mix of religious zeal, political maneuvering, and financial desperation. We'll explore the key figures who led the crusade, the complex relationships between Western Europe and the Byzantine Empire, and the dramatic series of events that culminated in one of the most shocking moments in medieval history. So, get comfortable, relax, and let's begin this journey into the unexpected twists and turns of the Fourth Crusade. What started with a noble goal would end in tragedy and change the course of history forever. To understand the events that led to the Fourth Crusade, it's essential to examine the broader context of Europe and the Eastern Mediterranean at the close of the 12th century. This period was marked by significant political, economic, and religious developments that set the stage for one of the most controversial campaigns in the history of the Crusades. The Aftermath of the Third Crusade The Third Crusade, led by Richard the Lionheart and Saladin, had ended in 1192 with the Treaty of Jaffa. While this treaty allowed Christian pilgrims access to Jerusalem, it left the city in Muslim hands and failed to achieve the broader objective of reclaiming the Holy Land for Christendom. The Crusader states, particularly the Kingdom of Jerusalem, now centered in Acre, remained precariously situated, constantly under threat from Muslim forces. The relative stability brought by the treaty was fragile, and tensions in the region persisted. The Crusader states were weakened and relied heavily on support from Europe to maintain their defense. However, the disillusionment from the partial success of the Third Crusade, coupled with the enormous costs of such campaigns, led to a waning enthusiasm for further military expeditions to the east. The Papacy and the Call for a New Crusade In Rome, Pope Innocent III ascended to the Papacy in 1198 with a vision of reasserting papal authority across Europe and revitalizing the crusading movement. Innocent III was one of the most powerful and ambitious popes of the medieval period, and he saw the recovery of Jerusalem as a divine mission that would unify Christendom under the leadership of the Church. Innocent III issued a call for a new crusade, urging the Christian kings and nobility of Europe to take up the cross once more. However, unlike the previous crusades, which had been led by powerful monarchs, the Fourth Crusade struggled to find strong leadership. Many of Europe's kings were either embroiled in their own conflicts or reluctant to commit the vast resources required for such an undertaking. As a result, the leadership of the crusade fell to a group of lesser nobles, primarily from France, who lacked the resources and influence of their predecessors. Economic Pressures and the Role of Venice one of the defining features of the Fourth Crusade was the significant role played by economic factors, particularly the involvement of the Republic of Venice. Venice was a powerful maritime state with vast commercial interests across the Mediterranean. The Venetians had grown wealthy through trade with the East and were keen to expand their influence further. The leaders of the Fourth Crusade Recognizing the need for a fleet to transport their armies to the Holy Land, approached Venice for assistance. The Doge of Venice, Enrico Dandolo, agreed to provide the necessary ships, but at a steep price. The Crusaders, however, were unable to raise the full amount needed to pay the Venetians, 
leading to a series of events that would drastically alter the course of the crusade. To sell their debt, the Venetians proposed that the crusaders assist them in capturing the Christian city of Zara, a rival to Venice on the Adriatic coast. Despite the objections of Pope Innocent III, who condemned the attack on a fellow Christian city, the crusaders, desperate for Venetian support, agreed to the plan. The sack of Zara in 1202 marked the first major deviation from the original goal of the crusade and set a precedent for further compromises. The Byzantine Empire and its internal struggles. While the crusaders were preparing their campaign, the Byzantine Empire was facing its own set of challenges. The once great empire had been weakened by decades of internal strife, including power struggles, rebellions, and economic difficulties. The Byzantine emperors were often seen as more concerned with their own internal issues than with the defense of Christendom, which led to strained relations with the Western powers. By the time of the Fourth Crusade, the Byzantine Empire was ruled by Alexios III Angelos, who had seized the throne in a coup against his brother, Isaac II. Alexios III was seen as an ineffective ruler, more interested in maintaining his own power than in addressing the empire's many problems. This internal instability made the Byzantine Empire vulnerable to external threats and, as events would soon show, to manipulation by those seeking to exploit its weaknesses. It was against this backdrop of religious zeal, economic ambition, and political instability that the Fourth Crusade was launched. The original aim of reclaiming Jerusalem would soon be overshadowed by other interests, leading the Crusaders down a path that would forever change the relationship between the East and West. In the late 12th and early 13th centuries, life for people in Europe and the Eastern Mediterranean was shaped by a mix of social structures, religious practices, and daily routines that varied widely depending on one's status, location, and role in society. This period was marked by contrasts between the lives of the wealthy and the poor, the rural and the urban, and the Christian West and the Byzantine East. In Western Europe, society was predominantly rural, with most people living in small villages scattered across the countryside. The majority of the population were peasants who worked the land to produce food for themselves and their lords. Life was hard, with long days spent in the fields tending crops or caring for livestock. The peasants lived in simple, thatched roof cottages, often with little more than a single room shared by the entire family. Their diet was basic, consisting mainly of bread, porridge, and vegetables, with meat reserved for special occasions. Despite the hardships, village life had a strong sense of community, with festivals, religious observances, and market days providing opportunities for social interaction and a break from the daily grind. Above the peasants were the nobility, who owned the land and held power over the rural population. The nobility lived in castles or manor houses, which were fortified to protect against the frequent conflicts and raids that characterized the medieval period. Their lives were more comfortable and luxurious than those of the peasants, with access to finer foods, clothing, and entertainment. The nobles were often involved in managing their estates, overseeing the work of their tenants, and administering justice in their domains. They also participated in the martial culture of the time, training in the arts of war and often engaging in tournaments or military campaigns. In the towns and cities, life was different from the rural countryside. Urban centers were growing during this period fueled by trade and commerce. Cities like Venice, Paris, and Constantinople were bustling hubs of activity with markets, workshops, and merchant houses lining the streets. The rise of a merchant class was one of the significant social developments of this period. Merchants and artisans, 
who produce goods ranging from cloth and shoes to metalwork and pottery, played a vital role in the urban economy. These townspeople, though not as wealthy or powerful as the nobility, were increasingly influential, particularly in regions where trade flourished. Religious life was central to the daily existence of people across Europe and the Eastern Mediterranean. The church was a dominant force in Western Europe, not only as a religious institution but also as a political and social authority. People's lives were marked by the rhythms of the Christian calendar, with festivals like Christmas, Easter, and various saints' days providing both spiritual significance and opportunities for celebration. The local parish church was the focal point of community life, where people gathered not only for worship but also for social events and important life milestones such as baptisms, weddings, and funerals. Monasticism also played a significant role in the social and spiritual life of the time. Monasteries were centers of learning, agriculture, and charity, where monks and nuns devoted their lives to prayer, study, and work. These religious communities often provided services like education and medical care, and they were important landowners and economic players in their regions. In the Byzantine Empire, social life had a different character. The empire was more urbanized than much of Western Europe, with Constantinople standing as one of the largest and most sophisticated cities in the world. This city was a marvel of architecture, filled with grand churches, palaces, and public buildings. The social hierarchy in Byzantium was also distinct, with a complex bureaucracy that controlled the empire's vast territories. The emperor was at the top of this hierarchy, considered God's representative on earth, ruling with the support of a powerful aristocracy. The Byzantine population included a mix of ethnicities, reflecting the empire's vast reach across Europe and Asia. Greek was the dominant language, and the Eastern Orthodox Church played a central role in daily life, much as the Catholic Church did in the West. Religious devotion was intense, with icons, relics, and pilgrimage sites being central to the spiritual lives of the Byzantine people. For the average Byzantine, life in the city or countryside involved a mix of work, religious observance, and social interaction. In Constantinople, the people enjoyed a variety of public entertainments, including chariot races at the Hippodrome, religious processions, and theatrical performances. The bustling marketplaces offered goods from all over the world, reflecting the empire's connections with Asia, Africa, and Europe. Despite the differences in lifestyle between the West and the East, one thing that united people across Christendom was the idea of pilgrimage. For many, the journey to a holy site, whether it was Rome, Santiago de Compostela, or Jerusalem, was a central religious experience. Pilgrims travel for weeks or months, often facing great hardships, to visit these sacred places. The act of pilgrimage was seen as a way to atone for sins seek divine favor, or fulfill a religious vow. As the Fourth Crusade was being planned, these pilgrims' journeys to the Holy Land were becoming increasingly difficult due to the ongoing conflicts between Christian and Muslim forces. The desire to secure safe passage for pilgrims and to reclaim the holy sites was one of the motivations behind the Crusade, though, as history would show, the goals of the Crusaders would ultimately diverge from these pious intentions. In this period leading up to the Fourth Crusade, society was marked by a mix of continuity and change. The rhythms of daily life continued much as they have for centuries, with people's lives centered around their families, their work, and their faith. Yet, the world was also changing, with the rise of cities, the expansion of trade, and the growing influence of new social classes. 
These changes set the stage for the events that would unfold during the Crusade, as the forces of tradition and innovation collided in ways that would reshape the medieval world. In the years leading up to the Fourth Crusade, the political landscape of Europe and the Eastern Mediterranean was marked by a web of alliances, rivalries, and power struggles that would eventually shape the course of the Crusade. The political dynamics of the time were complex, involving not only the major monarchies of Western Europe but also the Byzantine Empire, the Papacy, and the powerful maritime republics like Venice. Each of these entities had its own interests and ambitions, which played a crucial role in the unfolding of the events that would lead to the Crusades' dramatic and unexpected outcome. In Western Europe, the major kingdoms, France, England, and the Holy Roman Empire, were all dealing with their own internal and external challenges. France, under King Philip II, was a powerful and expanding kingdom, but Philip's focus was primarily on consolidating his control over French territories and dealing with his ongoing rivalry with England. The English crown, held by King John after the death of Richard the Lionheart, was preoccupied with maintaining control over its Angevin possessions in France and dealing with internal unrest. These distractions meant that neither France nor England was in a position to fully commit to a new crusade, leaving leadership of the effort to lesser nobles and figures who were not as politically influential. The Holy Roman Empire, a vast and diverse collection of territories in Central Europe, was another significant player. However, the empire was experiencing internal fragmentation and power struggles, particularly between the emperor and the German princes, as well as ongoing conflicts with the papacy. After the death of Emperor Henry VI in 1197, the empire was left in a state of political uncertainty, further diminishing its ability to play a leading role in the crusade. This power vacuum in Western Europe left the crusade without the strong, centralized leadership that had characterized earlier efforts, making it more vulnerable to external influences. One of the most significant political entities in this period was the Byzantine Empire, which had once been the dominant Christian power in the Eastern Mediterranean but was now in a state of decline. The empire was weakened by decades of internal strife, including power struggles within the ruling Angelos dynasty. Alexios III Angelos, who had seized the throne from his brother Isaac II in 1195, was an ineffective and corrupt ruler more concerned with maintaining his own power than with addressing the empire's mounting problems. The Byzantine Empire was also under pressure from external threats, particularly the encroaching Seljuk Turks, and was struggling to maintain control over its territories. The relationship between the Byzantine Empire and the Western European powers had been strained for centuries, exacerbated by religious differences between the Orthodox East and the Catholic West. The Byzantines were often viewed with suspicion and resentment by the Western Crusaders, who perceived them as unreliable allies in the struggle against Muslim forces. This mistrust would play a critical role in the events of the Fourth Crusade, as the Crusaders would come to see the Byzantines not as fellow Christians but as obstacles to their goals. The papacy, under Pope Innocent III, was a central player in the political landscape of the time. Innocent III was one of the most powerful and ambitious popes of the medieval period, and he was determined to assert the authority of the church over both spiritual and temporal matters. Innocent saw the Crusades as a divine mission to reclaim the Holy Land and to unite Christendom under papal leadership. He issued the call for the Fourth Crusade in 1198, hoping to reignite the zeal for crusading that had waned after the relative failure of the Third Crusade. However, Innocent III's ambitions were complicated by the political realities of Europe. The major monarchs were either unwilling or unable to take up the cross in significant numbers, leaving the crusade largely in the hands of lesser nobles and knights. 
The papacy's influence was further challenged by the growing power of the maritime republics, particularly Venice, which had its own agenda in the eastern Mediterranean. Venice, by this time, was one of the most powerful and wealthy states in Europe, with a vast commercial empire stretching across the Mediterranean. The Venetians were primarily motivated by economic interests, and they saw the Fourth Crusade as an opportunity to expand their influence and eliminate commercial rivals. The Doge of Venice, Enrico Dandolo, was a shrewd and ambitious leader who played a pivotal role in redirecting the crusade from its original goal of Jerusalem to other targets that aligned more closely with Venetian interests. When the crusaders approached Venice for ships to transport their army to the Holy Land, Dandolo saw an opportunity. The crusaders, unable to pay the full amount required for the fleet, were persuaded by Dandolo to assist Venice in capturing the Christian city of Zara, a rival to Venice in the Adriatic. This diversion was the first major step away from the original goals of the crusade and set a precedent for further deviations that would ultimately lead to the sack of Constantinople. In summary, the political landscape before the Fourth Crusade was shaped by a mix of weakened and distracted monarchies in Western Europe, a declining Byzantine Empire, a powerful and ambitious papacy, and a Venice that was increasingly dominant in Mediterranean affairs. These factors combined to create a situation where the Crusade, initially conceived as a holy mission to reclaim Jerusalem, became entangled in the political and economic ambitions of the various powers involved. The result was a crusade that would take an unexpected and controversial turn, culminating in one of the most dramatic and tragic events of the medieval period. In the years leading up to the Fourth Crusade, several key figures played pivotal roles in shaping the events that would eventually lead to one of the most controversial and unexpected outcomes in the history of the Crusades. These individuals, from religious leaders and political rulers to military commanders, each had their own ambitions and motivations, which influenced the direction and ultimate fate of the crusade. Pope Innocent III was one of the most powerful and influential popes of the medieval period. Upon his election to the papacy, he was determined to assert the authority of the church over secular rulers and to lead Christendom in a renewed effort to reclaim the Holy Land. Innocent III's vision for the Fourth Crusade was ambitious. He intended it to be a unifying force for Christian Europe, both spiritually and politically. He issued the call for the Crusade, hoping to achieve what the previous Crusades had not the full recapture of Jerusalem and the defeat of Muslim forces in the Levant. However, despite his strong spiritual leadership, Innocent III struggled to maintain control over the crusade as it became increasingly dominated by secular and economic interests. Enrico Dandolo, the Doge of Venice, was a key figure in the Fourth Crusade. Despite his advanced age and partial blindness, Dandolo was a shrewd and ambitious leader who saw the crusade as an opportunity to further Venice's economic and political interests. When the crusaders were unable to pay the full amount for the Venetian fleet that was to transport them to the Holy Land, Dandolo used this to his advantage. He persuaded the crusaders to attack the Christian city of Zara, a rival to Venice in the Adriatic. This diversion marked the first major shift away from the Crusade's original goal of reaching Jerusalem. Dandolo's influence reached its peak when he redirected the Crusade towards Constantinople, leading to the infamous sack of the city. His actions were driven by Venice's desire to expand its influence in the eastern Mediterranean. Alexios IV Angelos played a pivotal role in the events that led the Crusaders to Constantinople. He was the son of the deposed Byzantine Emperor Isaac II, who had been overthrown by his brother, Alexios III. Seeking to regain his father's throne, Alexios IV fled to the west and sought the help of the Crusaders. 
He promised them substantial financial support, military assistance, and the reunification of the Eastern Orthodox Church with Rome if they helped him reclaim the Byzantine throne. The promise of wealth and support was highly appealing to the Crusaders, who were struggling financially and were in need of resources to continue their campaign. However, once Alexios IV was installed as co-emperor in Constantinople, he found himself unable to fulfill his promises, leading to tensions and ultimately contributing to the Crusaders' decision to sack the city. Boniface of Montferrat was one of the leading noblemen who took up the cross for the Fourth Crusade. After the death of Thibault of Champagne, who was initially chosen to lead the Crusade, Boniface was selected as the new leader. A respected and experienced military commander, Boniface had connections to the Byzantine Empire through marriage, which influenced his involvement in the Crusade. His leadership was marked by attempts to balance the religious objectives of the crusade with the political opportunities that arose, particularly regarding the situation in Constantinople. Boniface's actions during the crusade reflected the complex interplay of personal ambition and the broader goals of the crusade. Baldwin of Flanders was another prominent nobleman and one of the key leaders of the Fourth Crusade. A capable military commander, Baldwin played a significant role in the Crusader army's operations. After the fall of Constantinople, Baldwin was elected as the first Latin Emperor of Constantinople, a position that marked the beginning of the Latin Empire in Byzantine territories. His election to this position highlighted the transformation of the Fourth Crusade from a religious expedition into a campaign of conquest and political power in the East. These individuals, each with their own motivations and ambitions, were instrumental in shaping the course and outcome of the Fourth Crusade. Their decisions and actions not only influenced the immediate events of the Crusade but also had lasting consequences for the Byzantine Empire the Crusader states, and the broader relationship between the Christian West and the Orthodox East. The complex interplay of religious fervor, political ambition, and economic interests ultimately led to one of the most dramatic and controversial episodes in the history of the Crusades. In October 1202, the Fourth Crusade officially set sail from Venice. The departure marked the beginning of a journey that had already deviated from its original purpose. The Crusaders had initially planned to head directly to the Holy Land, but financial difficulties forced them to accept an alternative plan proposed by the Doge of Venice, Enrico Dandolo. Instead of sailing to Jerusalem, the Crusaders agreed to first assist Venice in capturing the Christian city of Zara which had rebelled against Venetian control. By early November 1202, the Crusader fleet reached Zara, located on the Dalmatian coast. Despite being a Christian city, Zara was besieged and captured by the Crusaders with the support of the Venetian navy. The city's defenses were no match for the combined forces of the Crusaders and Venetians, and after a brief but intense assault, Zara fell. The Crusaders sacked the city, despite the protests of its inhabitants and the explicit orders of Pope Innocent III, who had condemned any attacks on Christian cities. The Pope's disapproval and the excommunication of the Crusader leaders, however, did not deter the Crusaders from their course of action. Following the sack of Zara, the Crusaders remained in the city for the winter, uncertain of their next move. It was during this time that they were approached by envoys from Alexios for Angelos, the son of the deposed Byzantine Emperor Isaac II. Alexios for offered the Crusaders a deal in exchange for their support in reclaiming his father's throne in Constantinople. He promised them financial rewards, military assistance, and the reunification of the Eastern Orthodox Church with Rome. This offer presented the Crusaders with a new opportunity to secure the resources they desperately needed. 
The decision to accept Alexios Ivy's proposal was made during these two months as the Crusaders considered the promise of wealth and the strategic advantages it could bring. However, this decision also marked a significant shift in the Crusade's focus, from a mission to reclaim the Holy Land to a campaign that would soon be directed toward Constantinople. By the end of December 1202, the stage was set for the next phase of the Crusade. The Crusaders, having completed their first major action with the capture of Zara, were now preparing to embark on a journey that would take them to the heart of the Byzantine Empire, setting the course for the events that would dramatically alter the history of the Crusade and the medieval world. In the early months of 1203, the Crusaders found themselves in Zara, where they had spent the winter after capturing the city in November 1202. The decision to attack Zara had already sparked controversy and earned the disapproval of Pope Innocent III, who excommunicated the Crusader leaders for their actions against a fellow Christian city. Despite this, the Crusaders were now faced with the critical decision of where to direct their efforts next. During January and February 1203, the Crusader leadership, including Boniface of Montferrat and Enrico Dandolo, engaged in intense discussions about the future course of the Crusade. The winter months in Zara were marked by uncertainty and mounting pressure. The Crusaders had depleted much of their resources, and morale among the troops was beginning to wane. Many Crusaders were concerned that their mission had already strayed far from its original purpose of reclaiming Jerusalem. The harsh winter weather added to the challenges, as the Crusaders faced difficulties in securing adequate supplies and maintaining their strength. It was in this atmosphere of uncertainty that envoys from Alexios for Angelos arrived in Zara. Alexios IV, the son of the deposed Byzantine Emperor Isaac II, had been seeking support from the West to reclaim his father's throne from his uncle, Alexios III, who had usurped power in Constantinople. The envoys carried a compelling offer, if the Crusaders would assist Alexios IV in retaking Constantinople, he promised to reward them with vast sums of money, military support for their campaign in the Holy Land, and the reunification of the Eastern Orthodox Church with Rome. This offer was both tempting and controversial. The promise of financial resources was particularly appealing to the Crusaders, who were in desperate need of funds to continue their journey. Moreover, the idea of securing military assistance from the Byzantine Empire seemed like a strategic advantage that could strengthen their efforts to reclaim Jerusalem. However, many within the Crusader ranks were deeply troubled by the prospect of diverting their mission to attack a Christian city, especially one as significant as Constantinople. Throughout January and February, the Crusader leaders debated the merits and risks of supporting Alexios IV. Boniface of Montferrat, who had personal connections to the Byzantine Empire, was inclined to accept the offer, seeing it as a pragmatic solution to their financial and logistical problems. Enrico Dandolo, the Doge of Venice, also supported the plan, as it aligned with Venice's broader strategic interests in the Eastern Mediterranean. However, not all Crusaders were convinced. There was a strong sense of unease among the rank and file soldiers, many of whom had taken up the cross with the intention of fighting Muslims in the Holy Land, not Christians in Constantinople. Some leaders, such as Simon de Montfort, openly opposed the idea of attacking Constantinople and expressed their concerns about the moral implications of such a decision. Despite these reservations, the promise of Alexios IV's support was ultimately too enticing to resist. The Crusaders were acutely aware that without additional resources and support, their campaign to reclaim Jerusalem might never reach its destination. By the end of February 1203, the decision was made, the Crusade would be diverted to Constantinople to support Alexios for in his bid to reclaim the Byzantine throne. 
With this decision, the nature of the Fourth Crusade was irrevocably changed. What had begun as a mission to reclaim the Holy Land had now become entangled in the complex political struggles of the Byzantine Empire. The Crusaders, who had set out with the intention of fighting for their faith, were now preparing to embark on a campaign that would pit them against fellow Christians in one of the most significant cities in the Christian world. In preparation for the journey to Constantinople, the Crusaders spent the remainder of February gathering supplies, repairing ships, and organizing their forces. The prospect of sailing to the Byzantine capital filled the Crusaders with a mix of anticipation and anxiety. Constantinople was a city of legendary wealth and power, but it was also known for its formidable defenses. The Crusaders knew that they were about to undertake one of the most challenging and potentially perilous missions of the entire Crusade. As March approached, the Crusaders made their final preparations to leave Zara and set sail for Constantinople. The decision to support Alexios for had been made, but the full consequences of that decision were yet to be realized. The Crusaders were heading into unknown territory, both literally and figuratively, as they prepared to confront the complexities of Byzantine politics and the daunting challenge of capturing one of the most impregnable cities in the world. The first two months of 1203 had seen the Fourth Crusade take a dramatic turn, setting it on a course that would lead to events no one could have predicted when the Crusaders first took up the cross. The next leg of their journey would take them to the gates of Constantinople, where the fate of the Crusade, and of the Byzantine Empire, would be decided. As March 1203 gave way to April, the Crusaders, having resolved to support Alexios for Angelos in his quest to reclaim the Byzantine throne, departed from Zara and began their journey toward Constantinople. The fleet, still under the command of Boniface of Montferrat and Enrico Dandolo, sailed across the Adriatic Sea, heading toward the Byzantine capital with a mix of trepidation and anticipation. The decision to divert the crusade to Constantinople had been controversial, and as the fleet made its way across the sea, the weight of this decision hung heavily over the crusaders. Many of them had joined the crusade with the expectation of fighting to reclaim Jerusalem, not engaging in the internal politics of the Byzantine Empire. Yet, the promise of vast riches and the strategic advantages of controlling Constantinople were powerful motivators, and most of the crusaders remained committed to the course they had set. By early April, the fleet began to approach the shores of the Byzantine Empire. The Crusaders first made landfall at the island of Corfu, which was then under Byzantine control. Here, they took the opportunity to regroup, resupply, and make final preparations for the assault on Constantinople. The stay at Corfu also allowed the Crusaders to communicate with local Byzantine officials who were initially unaware of the true purpose of their arrival. The island's leaders, still loyal to the reigning Emperor Alexios III, were soon informed of the Crusaders' intentions to support Alexios IV's claim to the throne, leading to heightened tensions. As the fleet set sail from Corfu in mid-April, it became clear that the Crusaders were entering a hostile and uncertain environment. The journey to Constantinople was fraught with the possibility of encountering Byzantine naval forces and the prospect of a direct confrontation loomed large. However, the Crusaders were determined, and by late April, they had reached the shores of Thrace, the region surrounding Constantinople. The sight of Constantinople on the horizon was a moment of awe and apprehension for the Crusaders. The city, with its massive walls and formidable defenses, stood as a symbol of the Byzantine Empire's enduring power and prestige. The Crusaders, many of whom had never seen a city of such scale and grandeur, were acutely aware of the challenge that lay before them. Constantinople was not only one of the largest cities in the world, but also one of the most heavily fortified. 
The city had withstood numerous sieges over the centuries, and its defenders were known for their skill and determination. In late April, the Crusaders established a camp on the outskirts of Constantinople, near the harbor of Galata. Here, they made contact with Alexios IV, who had been in hiding since his flight from the city. The young prince, eager to reclaim his birthright, urged the Crusaders to press forward with their plan to overthrow his uncle, Alexios III. The Crusaders, however, were cautious. They knew that an all-out assault on Constantinople would be a daunting task, and they were not yet fully aware of the internal divisions within the city that might work to their advantage. The first attempts at negotiation with Alexios III were unsuccessful. The reigning emperor, aware of the crusaders' intentions, refused to abdicate and began to fortify the city's defenses. Despite his unpopularity and the widespread dissatisfaction among the Byzantine populace, Alexios III still commanded the loyalty of key military units and the support of the city's elite. The Crusaders, for their part, continued to hope that a show of force might persuade the Emperor to step down without a prolonged conflict. As May 1203 arrived, the situation grew more tense. The Crusaders, having secured the harbor of Galata, began to prepare for a possible assault on the city's formidable sea walls. The Venetians, with their extensive naval experience, played a crucial role in these preparations, constructing siege engines and positioning their ships to support a land and sea attack. The Crusaders also attempted to gather intelligence on the city's defenses and the mood within Constantinople, hoping to identify potential allies or weaknesses they could exploit. Inside Constantinople, the atmosphere was one of growing fear and uncertainty. Alexios III, who had come to power through treachery, was deeply unpopular, and many within the city saw the arrival of the Crusaders as an opportunity for change. However, the city's defenders were also determined to protect their homes and maintain the empire's independence from western interference. The Byzantine military, though weakened by years of neglect and corruption, still posed a significant threat to the Crusaders. In mid-May, the Crusaders launched their first major assault on Constantinople's sea walls. The attack was a combination of naval and land forces, with Venetian ships attempting to breach the walls from the sea while Crusader knights and infantry attacked from the land. The initial assault was met with fierce resistance from the Byzantine defenders, who repelled the attackers with a barrage of arrows, stones, and Greek fire. Despite their best efforts, the Crusaders were unable to breach the walls, and the attack ended in a stalemate. The failure of the first assault did not deter the Crusaders, but it did force them to reconsider their strategy. The leaders of the Crusade met to discuss their next steps, knowing that a prolonged siege could deplete their resources and weaken their resolve. However, they were also aware that retreat was not an option. The promises made by Alexios IV, along with the potential rewards of capturing Constantinople, were too great to abandon. As May drew to a close, the Crusaders began to prepare for a renewed assault on the city, this time focusing on a different section of the walls. The Venetians, undeterred by the previous failure, continued to construct new siege engines and refine their tactics. The Crusaders also intensified their efforts to gather support within the city, hoping that discontent with Alexios III might lead to an internal revolt that could open the gates to the invaders. The first two months of the Crusaders' campaign against Constantinople had been marked by challenges and setbacks, but the resolve of the Crusaders remained strong. The decision to support Alexios IV had set them on a path that would ultimately lead to one of the most dramatic and consequential events in medieval history, the eventual fall of Constantinople to the Crusaders. As spring turned to summer, 
the stage was set for the next phase of the siege, a phase that would determine the fate of both the Crusade and the Byzantine Empire. As June 1203 began, the tension around Constantinople continued to build. The Crusaders, now fully committed to their cause, prepared for a renewed assault on the city. The previous months had been filled with planning, negotiation, and an unsuccessful initial attack on the city's formidable sea walls. Despite these setbacks, the Crusaders were determined to press on, driven by the promise of rewards from Alexios for Angelos and the potential for glory. The early days of June were marked by intense activity within the Crusader camp. The leaders, including Boniface of Montferrat and Enrico Dandolo, coordinated their forces for another assault on Constantinople. The Venetians, with their naval expertise, played a critical role in this preparation. They constructed additional siege engines and improved the designs of their ships to better withstand the Byzantine defenses. Meanwhile, the Crusaders on land focused on fortifying their positions around the harbor of Galata, ensuring they had a secure base from which to launch their attacks. Inside Constantinople, the atmosphere was one of increasing fear and uncertainty. Emperor Alexios III, who had already proven to be an ineffective ruler, struggled to maintain control. The people of Constantinople were divided, while some remained loyal to Alexios III, many others were disillusioned with his leadership and viewed the Crusaders as potential liberators who might restore the former Emperor Isaac II and his son Alexios IV. The lack of strong leadership within the city only heightened the sense of impending doom. By mid-June, the Crusaders were ready for their second major assault on the city. This time, they focused their efforts on a different section of the sea walls, hoping to catch the defenders off guard. The attack was carefully coordinated, with the Venetians launching a naval assault while the land forces, including knights and infantry, attacked from multiple points along the walls. The assault began with a barrage of projectiles from the Crusaders' siege engines designed to weaken the walls and create openings for the infantry to exploit. The Venetians, leading the naval attack, used their ships to approach the walls and deploy ladders, allowing their soldiers to climb up and engage the Byzantine defenders directly. The fighting was fierce, with both sides sustaining heavy casualties. The defenders of Constantinople, using Greek fire and other defensive tactics, managed to repel several attempts by the Crusaders to breach the walls. Despite the fierce resistance, the Crusaders made some progress. After several hours of intense fighting, a small breach was made in one section of the walls, allowing a group of Crusaders to enter the city. This breach, though not large enough to allow a full-scale invasion, was significant. It demonstrated that the city's defenses were not invincible and that a determined assault could succeed. The news of the breach spread quickly through Constantinople, further destabilizing the already fragile morale of the defenders. Within the city, rumors began to circulate that Alexios III was planning to flee, abandoning his people in their time of need. These rumors were not unfounded, Alexios III, realizing that he could not withstand another prolonged assault, began to secretly prepare for his escape. In late June, Alexios III made his move. Under the cover of darkness, he fled Constantinople with as much of the imperial treasury as he could carry, leaving the city and its inhabitants to face the Crusaders alone. His departure created a power vacuum within the city, and the Byzantine nobility, desperate to restore order, quickly reinstalled Isaac II, the blind and ailing former emperor, to the throne. Alongside him, his son, Alexios IV, was declared co-emperor, fulfilling part of the promise made to the Crusaders. 
the sudden fly of Alexios III and the restoration of Isaac II and Alexios IV marked a dramatic turning point in the siege. The gates of Constantinople were open to the Crusaders, who entered the city not as conquerors but as allies of the new regime. The citizens of Constantinople, weary from the prolonged siege and relieved by the departure of Alexios III, largely welcomed the change in leadership, although tensions remained high. Throughout July, the Crusaders worked closely with the new emperors to stabilize the city. Alexios IV, eager to fulfill his promises, began to distribute payments to the Crusaders and Venetians, although the Empire's treasury, weakened by years of mismanagement and the recent flight of funds with Alexios III, was insufficient to fully satisfy their demands. This shortfall led to growing frustrations among the Crusaders, who had been counting on the promised wealth to fund their continued campaign to the Holy Land. At the same time, Alexios IV attempted to solidify his rule by reaching out to various factions within the city, seeking to secure their loyalty. He also began discussions with the papacy about the potential reunification of the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic churches, a move that was highly controversial and faced significant opposition within the Byzantine clergy and populace. As August arrived, the situation in Constantinople became increasingly volatile. The relationship between the Crusaders and the new Byzantine regime, initially based on mutual benefit, began to fray. The promised payments from Alexios IV were slow to materialize, and the Crusaders, many of whom were eager to continue their journey to Jerusalem, grew restless. The presence of the Crusader army in Constantinople also caused tensions within the city, as the local population resented the foreign troops and the disruption they brought. By late August, the strained relationship between the Crusaders and Alexios IV was becoming a serious problem. The young emperor, struggling to maintain his authority and fulfill his promises, found himself increasingly isolated. Within the city, factions opposed to the Crusaders' presence began to gain influence and there were growing fears that the fragile alliance between the Crusaders and the Byzantine regime might collapse. As the summer of 1203 drew to a close, the Fourth Crusade was at a critical juncture. The initial success of installing Alexios IV on the throne had given the Crusaders hope that their mission might yet be salvaged, but the challenges of governing a deeply divided city and securing the promised rewards were proving to be greater than anticipated. The stage was set for further conflict and intrigue, as the ambitions of the Crusaders and the realities of Byzantine politics continued to clash in the months ahead. In September 1203, the situation in Constantinople had grown increasingly volatile as the fragile alliance between the Crusaders and the newly reinstated Emperor Alexios IV began to crumble. The initial optimism that had accompanied Alexios IV's return to power was rapidly fading. The young emperor had promised the Crusaders vast sums of money, military support, and the reunification of the Eastern and Western churches. However, as the months passed, it became clear that the Byzantine treasury was far too depleted to meet these promises, and the tensions between the Crusaders and the Byzantines grew. The Crusaders, who had taken up arms with the goal of reclaiming Jerusalem, found themselves stuck in Constantinople, waiting for the payments they had been promised. The longer they stayed, the more restless they became. Their presence in the city was increasingly resented by the local population, who viewed them as unwelcome occupiers. The citizens of Constantinople, already disillusioned with Alexios IV's rule, began to blame him for the presence of the Crusaders and the financial strain their demands were placing on the city. In an attempt to fulfill his promises, Alexios IV resorted to raising taxes and confiscating treasures from the churches. These measures were deeply unpopular and only served to further alienate the Byzantines from their ruler. 
The people of Constantinople, already suffering from years of economic decline and political instability, saw these actions as yet another betrayal by an emperor who seemed more concerned with appeasing foreign mercenaries than with the welfare of his own people. As September progressed, anti-Latin sentiment in the city reached a fever pitch. The tension between the crusaders and the local population erupted into violence. Skirmishes broke out in the streets, with mobs attacking Latin merchants and settlers. The Crusaders, in turn, responded with force, further exacerbating the situation. The city, once a thriving metropolis, was now a powder keg, with the potential for a full-scale revolt growing by the day. Amidst this growing unrest, the Byzantine nobility and military leaders began to conspire against Alexios IV. They saw the emperor's reliance on the crusaders as a sign of weakness and believed that his continued rule would only lead to further degradation of the empire. These conspirators, many of whom had been sidelined by the pro-Latin policies of Alexios IV, began to plot his overthrow. In early October 1203, their plans came to fruition. A coup was launched by a faction of Byzantine nobles who opposed Alexios IV and the continued presence of the Crusaders in Constantinople. On October 8, 1203, the coup succeeded. Alexios IV was captured and imprisoned, and his father, Isaac II, was placed under house arrest. With the removal of the ruling regime, the city was thrown into turmoil, and the Crusaders found themselves suddenly without the support of the Emperor they had installed. In the aftermath of the coup, Alexios V. Dalkas, a military leader known for his strong and decisive nature, was proclaimed the new Emperor. Nicknamed Mort Suflos due to his heavy eyebrows, Alexios V. quickly took control of the situation. He was a staunch opponent of the Crusaders and had no intention of honoring the promises made by Alexios IV. His first actions as emperor included fortifying the city's defenses and rallying the Byzantine military to prepare for a potential attack. The rise of Alexios V marked a significant turning point in the relationship between the Crusaders and the Byzantine Empire. The alliance that had brought the Crusaders to Constantinople was now shattered, and the new emperor made it clear that he would not be paying the sums promised to the Crusaders. This refusal to pay, coupled with the hostile attitude of Alexios V, left the Crusaders in a dire situation. They had spent months in Constantinople, depleting their resources and waiting for payment that would never come. As October wore on, the Crusader leaders, including Boniface of Montferrat and Enrico Dandolo, faced a difficult decision. They could not return to Europe empty-handed, nor could they continue to the Holy Land without the promised funds. The only option left, as they saw it, was to take matters into their own hands. The idea of launching a full-scale assault on Constantinople began to gain traction among the Crusader leadership. While the prospect of attacking a Christian city was deeply troubling to many, the need to secure resources and salvage their mission outweighed their moral concerns. The Crusaders began to prepare for the possibility of laying siege to Constantinople. They fortified their positions around the city and started gathering supplies for what they knew would be a difficult and bloody campaign. At the same time, they continued to hope that the new emperor might reconsider his stance and negotiate a settlement that would allow them to leave the city peacefully. However, Alexios V was resolute in his opposition to the Crusaders. He saw them not as allies, but as invaders, and he was determined to defend the city at all costs. The people of Constantinople, rallying behind their new emperor, prepared for the possibility of a siege. The mood in the city was one of determination and defiance as the Byzantines readied themselves to repel the Crusaders. By the end of October 1203, 
the situation had reached a critical juncture. The Crusaders, once seen as liberators, were now viewed as a threat to the very existence of the Byzantine Empire. The stage was set for a confrontation that would determine the fate of Constantinople and the Fourth Crusade. As the city braced for the coming conflict, the events of September and October had made it clear that the Fourth Crusade had taken a dark and unexpected turn, leading to a conflict that would have profound consequences for both the Crusaders and the Byzantine Empire. As November 1203 began, the atmosphere in Constantinople was charged with anticipation and fear. The situation between the Crusaders and the Byzantines had deteriorated significantly. The Crusaders, led by Boniface of Montferrat and Enrico Dandolo, were now fully aware that their alliance with the Byzantine Empire, once tenuously held together by promises of wealth and support, had collapsed with the rise of Alexios V. Doukas to power. With Alexios V firmly in control, the new emperor wasted no time in solidifying his defenses against the Crusaders. He was determined to protect Constantinople from the Crusader threat and made it clear that he had no intention of fulfilling the promises made by his predecessor, Alexios IV. This defiant stance left the Crusaders with few options. The resources they had been counting on to continue their campaign to the Holy Land were no longer forthcoming and the prospect of returning to Europe empty-handed was unthinkable. Throughout November, tensions escalated as both sides prepared for the inevitable conflict. Alexios V ordered the fortification of Constantinople's already formidable walls, enhancing the city's defenses with additional troops and artillery. The Byzantine navy, though weakened, was positioned to defend the city from any attacks by sea. The citizens of Constantinople, many of whom were exhausted by the months of instability, now rally behind Alexios V, who was seen as a strong leader capable of defending the city against the Crusaders. On the other side, the Crusaders, frustrated and desperate, began to plan a direct assault on Constantinople. They knew that taking the city by force would be a monumental task. Constantinople was renowned for its massive and nearly impregnable walls, which had repelled numerous sieges over the centuries. Yet, the Crusaders were left with little choice. Their supplies were dwindling, and morale was sinking. The only way to salvage their mission was to seize the city and its wealth by force. In late November, the Crusaders launched their first serious assault on Constantinople. The attack was a coordinated effort by both land and sea, with the Venetian fleet playing a crucial role in the naval assault. Venetian ships, equipped with siege towers and ladders, approached the city's sea walls, while the Crusader infantry and knights attacked from the land. The battle was fierce and bloody. The Byzantine defenders, under the command of Alexios V, fought valiantly to repel the attackers, using Greek fire, arrows, and stones to push back the Crusaders. Despite their determination, the Crusaders faced significant challenges. The walls of Constantinople were incredibly strong, and the defenders were well prepared. The initial assaults failed to breach the walls, and the Crusaders were forced to retreat and regroup. However, they did not give up. Throughout December, they continued to launch attacks, each one more intense than the last, hoping to find a weakness in the city's defenses. Meanwhile, inside Constantinople, the mood was one of grim determination. The citizens, who had once been divided in their loyalties, now united under the leadership of Alexios V. The Emperor's strong stance against the Crusaders had earned him the support of the people who were willing to endure the hardships of a siege to defend their city. The streets of Constantinople were filled with soldiers and citizens alike, all preparing for what they knew would be a protracted and brutal conflict. 
As December progressed, the Crusaders intensified their efforts, launching several large-scale assaults on the city's walls. They also attempted to gain entry through the city's harbors, hoping that a surprise attack by sea might catch the defenders off guard. However, each attempt was met with fierce resistance. The defenders, well aware of the importance of holding the city, repelled the Crusaders time and again. By the end of December 1203, both sides were exhausted, but neither was willing to back down. The Crusaders, though battered and bruised, remained determined to take Constantinople, while the Byzantines, under Alexios V's leadership, were equally resolved to defend their city at all costs. The stage was set for a final, decisive confrontation as the Crusaders prepare for one last, all-out assault in the new year. The events of November and December had brought the Fourth Crusade to a critical juncture. What had begun as a mission to reclaim Jerusalem had now become a battle for the very heart of the Byzantine Empire. The outcome of this conflict would have far-reaching consequences, not only for the Crusaders and the Byzantines, but for the entire Christian world. As the year drew to a close, both sides braced themselves for the struggle that lay ahead, knowing that the fate of Constantinople, and perhaps the entire Eastern Mediterranean, hung in the balance. As January 1204 began, the bitter cold of winter did little to diminish the tension and determination on both sides of the walls of Constantinople. The Crusaders, having faced several failed assaults in the previous months, were now more resolved than ever to breach the city's defenses. The Byzantine defenders, under the leadership of Emperor Alexios V, were equally determined to protect their capital from the invaders. The stalemate could not last much longer. Both sides knew that a decisive battle was inevitable. Throughout January, the Crusaders continued their preparations for what they hoped would be a final, successful assault on Constantinople. Despite the harsh winter conditions, they worked tirelessly to repair and reinforce their siege engines, which had taken considerable damage during the previous assaults. The Venetian fleet, crucial to any attack on the city's sea walls, was also refitted and prepared for another round of battle. Inside Constantinople, Alexios V took advantage of the temporary lull in fighting to strengthen the city's defenses even further. He ordered additional fortifications to be built along the most vulnerable sections of the walls and ensured that the city's stockpiles of Greek fire, the Byzantine Empire's secret and deadly incendiary weapon, were ready for use. The Emperor also sought to boost the morale of the population by organizing religious processions and making public displays of confidence in the city's ability to withstand the siege. As the days of January passed, the Crusaders grew increasingly anxious. Their resources were dwindling, and their soldiers were weary from months of fighting and harsh conditions. The pressure on the Crusader leadership particularly Boniface of Montferrat and Enrico Dandolo, was immense. They knew that the future of the entire crusade depended on their ability to capture Constantinople and secure the wealth and supplies needed to continue their campaign to the Holy Land. By early February, the crusaders were ready to launch their final assault. This time, they planned to use all of their remaining resources in a coordinated attack on both the land and sea walls of Constantinople. The strategy involved a two-pronged assault. While the Venetian fleet would attack the sea walls, Crusader infantry and knights would focus their efforts on the land walls, hoping to create multiple breaches that could be exploited simultaneously. The assault began in mid-February 1204, with the Venetian fleet leading the charge. The ships, equipped with tall siege towers, approached the sea walls under a hail of Byzantine arrows and Greek fire. Despite the intense resistance, the Venetians managed to land several boarding parties on the walls, 
engaging the Byzantine defenders in fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat. On the land side, the Crusader infantry and knights, supported by siege engines, battered the walls with everything they had, determined to force their way into the city. After hours of brutal fighting, the Crusaders finally managed to breach the walls in several places. The Venetians, leveraging their naval expertise, succeeded in creating a foothold on the sea walls, while the Crusaders on land forced their way through a weakened section of the land walls. Once inside the city, the Crusaders poured into Constantinople, engaging in street-to-street -street fighting as they pushed toward the heart of the city. The fall of the walls marked the beginning of the end for Constantinople. As the Crusaders advanced through the city, panic spread among the population. The Byzantine defenders, demoralized by the breach and the relentless advance of the Crusaders, began to retreat or surrender. Emperor Alexios V, realizing that the city was lost, fled Constantinople under the cover of darkness, leading the city to its fate. By the end of February 1204, Constantinople had fallen to the Crusaders. The once mighty capital of the Byzantine Empire was now in the hands of the very forces it had sought to keep at bay. The Crusaders, exhausted but victorious, began to loot the city, taking whatever wealth and treasures they could find. The sack of Constantinople, which would continue for several days, marked one of the darkest chapters in the history of the Crusades. The fall of Constantinople was a turning point not only for the Fourth Crusade, but for the history of the Byzantine Empire and Christendom as a whole. The city, which had stood as a bastion of Eastern Christianity for nearly a thousand years, was now in ruins, its treasures plundered, and its people devastated. The Crusaders, who had set out to reclaim Jerusalem, had instead sacked one of the greatest cities of the Christian world. As March 1204 began, the reality of what had transpired began to sink in. The Crusader leaders, who had initially justified their actions as necessary for the continuation of their mission, now faced the consequences of their decision. The sack of Constantinople would have far-reaching implications, both for the Crusaders themselves and for the future of the Byzantine Empire. The events of January and February had brought the Fourth Crusade to its tragic conclusion, leaving a legacy of destruction and division that would resonate for centuries to come. In the aftermath of the fall of Constantinople in February 1204, the months of March and April were marked by the aftermath of the sack and the beginning of a new era in the city's history. The Crusaders, having breached the walls and seized control of the Byzantine capital, now faced the task of consolidating their victory and dealing with the consequences of their actions. Throughout March 1204, the Crusaders continued their looting of Constantinople. The city, which had once been the richest and most powerful in Christendom, was subjected to systematic pillaging. Churches, palaces, and homes were stripped of their valuables. Precious icons, relics, and works of art were either destroyed or taken as spoils. The Crusaders, who had initially embarked on their journey to reclaim the Holy Land, found themselves enriching their coffers at the expense of one of the greatest cities of the Christian world. The sack of Constantinople was brutal and indiscriminate. The Crusaders, driven by greed and a sense of betrayal by the Byzantines, showed little mercy to the inhabitants. Many citizens were killed, and countless others were subjected to violence and humiliation. The city, once a vibrant center of culture and religion, was left in ruins, its glory tarnished by the actions of those who claimed to be on a holy mission. As the pillaging continued, the leaders of the crusade began to grapple with the political and administrative vacuum left by the departure of Emperor Alexios V and the destruction of the Byzantine government. The Crusaders knew that they could not simply abandon Constantinople after sacking it, 
They needed to establish a new order to maintain control over the city and the surrounding territories. In late March, the Crusader leaders met to discuss the future of Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire. After much deliberation, they decided to establish a Latin Empire, a new political entity that would be ruled by Western European leaders and supported by the Crusader army. This decision marked a significant departure from the original goals of the Crusade as the focus shifted from reclaiming Jerusalem to securing control over the remnants of the Byzantine Empire. In early April 1204, the Crusaders elected Baldwin of Flanders as the first Latin Emperor of Constantinople. Baldwin, a respected leader with strong ties to the Crusader movement, was seen as a unifying figure who could bring stability to the newly conquered territories. His election was supported by the Venetians, who were eager to secure their own commercial interests in the Eastern Mediterranean. Enrico Dandolo, the Doge of Venice, played a crucial role in the establishment of the Latin Empire, ensuring that Venice received a significant share of the spoils and control over key trade routes. The coronation of Baldwin as emperor took place in the Hagia Sophia, the great cathedral of Constantinople that had been the spiritual heart of the Byzantine Empire. The ceremony, though grand, was overshadowed by the destruction that had preceded it. The Hagia Sophia, like much of the city, had been looted by the Crusaders, and its once majestic interior was now a stark reminder of the devastation wrought by the very people who now claimed to rule in the name of Christendom. As Baldwin took the throne, the Latin Empire was formally established with its capital in Constantinople. The empire was divided among the Crusader leaders, with various territories and titles being distributed as rewards for their service. Venice, in particular, benefited greatly from the partition, gaining control of key ports and islands that would enhance its dominance in Mediterranean trade. However, the establishment of the Latin Empire did little to restore stability to the region. The Byzantine aristocracy, though weakened, was not entirely defeated. In various parts of the former empire, Byzantine leaders who had escaped the fall of Constantinople began to organize resistance against the Latin rulers. The fragmentation of the Byzantine Empire into rival states including the Empire of Nicaea, the Despotate of Epirus, and the Empire of Trebizond, marked the beginning of a long and bitter struggle to reclaim the lost glory of Byzantium. As April 1204 came to an end, the Latin Empire was still in its infancy, struggling to establish its authority over a region that had been deeply scarred by the events of the previous months. The Crusaders, now rulers of a fractured and unstable empire, faced the daunting task of defending their new territories against both internal and external threats. The dream of reclaiming Jerusalem had been abandoned, replaced by the harsh realities of governing a city that had been brought to its knees by the very forces that had sworn to protect it. The events of March and April 1204 marked the beginning of a new chapter in the history of Constantinople, one that would be defined by the struggle between the Latin rulers and the remnants of the Byzantine Empire. The consequences of the Fourth Crusade would reverberate throughout the medieval world, reshaping the political and religious landscape of the Eastern Mediterranean for centuries to come. In the months of May and June 1204, the newly established Latin Empire of Constantinople faced the daunting challenge of solidifying its rule over the remnants of the Byzantine Empire. The city, still reeling from the brutal sack by the Crusaders, was in a state of disarray. The once great capital of Eastern Christendom had been reduced to a shadow of its former self, and the task of rebuilding both its physical and political structures fell to the new Latin rulers. Emperor Baldwin of Flanders, recently crowned as the first Latin Emperor of Constantinople, began to organize his government and assert control over the conquered territories. 
His rule was supported by the other crusader leaders, as well as by the Venetians, who had secured a significant portion of the empire's wealth and key strategic locations as part of the partition agreement. However, the process of consolidating power was far from easy. In May, Baldwin focused on securing the loyalty of the various Latin lords who had been granted fiefs and titles within the empire. These lords, many of whom had their own ambitions and interests, were given control over different regions of the former Byzantine Empire. However, the loyalty of these new Latin rulers was not guaranteed, as they were often more concerned with enriching themselves than with the stability of the empire. Baldwin's ability to maintain their allegiance would be crucial to the survival of the Latin Empire. Meanwhile, in the regions outside Constantinople, resistance to Latin rule was beginning to take shape. The remnants of the Byzantine aristocracy, although severely weakened by the fall of Constantinople, were not entirely defeated. In places like Nicaea, Epirus, and Trebizond, Byzantine leaders who had escaped the city began to organize their own independent states, refusing to recognize the authority of the Latin Empire. These regions became centers of resistance, where efforts to restore the Byzantine Empire were quickly gaining momentum. The Latin Empire also faced external threats from neighboring powers. In the Balkans, the Bulgarian Empire, under Tsar Kaloyan, viewed the weakened Byzantines and their new Latin rulers as an opportunity to expand their influence. The Bulgarians had a history of conflict with both the Byzantines and the Crusaders, and Kaloyan saw the instability in Constantinople as a chance to assert his dominance in the region. Throughout May and June, the Latin Empire's borders were under constant pressure from Bulgarian forces, forcing Baldwin to divert resources and attention away from internal consolidation to defend his fledgling empire. In June 1204, Tensions within the Latin Empire began to rise as disputes over territory and authority emerged among the Crusader leaders. The partition of the Empire, which had been agreed upon in the immediate aftermath of the city's fall, now seemed increasingly tenuous as individual leaders jockey for power and influence. The Venetians, led by Enrico Dandolo, sought to maintain control over their lucrative trade routes and territories, while other crusader lords, like Boniface of Montferrat, sought to expand their own domains. These internal conflicts further weakened the Latin Empire's ability to govern effectively. At the same time, within Constantinople itself, the challenges of ruling a hostile and devastated city became increasingly apparent. The Latin rulers were deeply unpopular among the Byzantine populace, who viewed them as foreign oppressors. The destruction of the city's wealth, combined with the heavy-handed tactics used by the Crusaders to maintain order, only fueled resentment. Religious tensions also played a significant role, as the Latin clergy, who followed Roman Catholicism, clashed with the Orthodox Christian population. The attempted imposition of Latin religious practices over the Byzantine Orthodox traditions deepened the cultural divide, making the Latin rulers' task of governing even more difficult. By the end of June 1204, the Latin Empire was already showing signs of strain. Emperor Baldwin faced the near impossible task of holding together an empire that was not only geographically vast and culturally diverse, but also deeply divided by the events of the Fourth Crusade. The resistance from Byzantine successor states, the threat from neighboring powers like Bulgaria, and the internal disputes among the Latin lords all combined to create an unstable and precarious situation. The events of May and June were a clear indication that the Latin Empire, despite its initial military success, would face significant challenges in the years to come. 
the dream of creating a stable and prosperous Latin kingdom in the heart of the former Byzantine Empire was rapidly being undermined by the realities of governing a conquered and divided land. The Latin rulers, far from securing their hold over Constantinople and its territories, were instead confronting the very real possibility of a protracted struggle for survival. As summer turned to fall, the fate of the Latin Empire remained uncertain. The legacy of the Fourth Crusade, marked by the sack of Constantinople and the establishment of Latin rule, was becoming increasingly clear, and it opened a new chapter of conflict and division in the Eastern Mediterranean, the repercussions of which would be felt for generations to come. In the months of July and August 1204, the Latin Empire of Constantinople continued to grapple with the immense challenges of ruling a vast and fragmented territory that had been hastily assembled in the wake of the Fourth Crusade. Emperor Baldwin I and his Latin rulers were struggling to maintain control over their newly acquired lands, facing resistance both from within and from external forces. During July, Emperor Baldwin focused on consolidating his power in Constantinople and the surrounding territories. The city itself, still recovering from the brutal sack earlier in the year, remained in a state of disrepair. Efforts to rebuild and restore order were hampered by the ongoing tension between the Latin rulers and the Byzantine population. The citizens of Constantinople, who had lived under Byzantine rule for centuries, continued to resist the Latin presence, both passively and actively. The Latin administration, unfamiliar with the complexities of governing such a diverse and culturally rich city, found it difficult to establish effective governance. In the regions outside Constantinople, the situation was equally precarious. The Byzantine successor states, particularly the Empire of Nicaea, the despotate of Epirus and the Empire of Trebizond continued to strengthen their positions and build their own power bases. These states were led by members of the Byzantine aristocracy who had escaped the fall of Constantinople and were now determined to reclaim their lost empire. Throughout July, these successor states consolidated their control over key territories, securing alliances and preparing for future conflicts with the Latin Empire. The threat from the Bulgarian Empire also loomed large over the Latin rulers. Tsar Kaloyan of Bulgaria, who had been watching the events in Constantinople closely, saw an opportunity to expand his influence at the expense of both the Latins and the Byzantines. In late July, Kaloyan began to launch raids into the territories controlled by the Latin Empire, testing the defenses of Baldwin's forces. These raids were a clear signal that Bulgaria intended to take advantage of the Latin Empire's weakened state, and they placed additional strain on Baldwin's already stretched resources. As August arrived, the internal divisions within the Latin leadership became more pronounced. The partitioning of the Byzantine Empire among the Crusader leaders had initially been agreed upon in the heat of victory, but the realities of governing such a vast and diverse territory were beginning to strain these arrangements. Disputes over land, titles, and authority flared up among the Latin lords, many of whom were more interested in securing their own power than in supporting the broader goals of the Latin Empire. These internal conflicts undermined Baldwin's ability to effectively lead the empire and weakened the unity of the Latin forces. The Venetians, who had played a crucial role in the conquest of Constantinople, were particularly interested in securing their commercial interests in the region. Enrico Dandolo, the Doge of Venice, ensured that Venice maintained control over key ports and trade routes in the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean. However, this focus on economic gain often put the Venetians at odds with other Latin leaders who were more concerned with territorial control and political power. The friction between the Venetians and other Latin rulers added another layer of complexity to the already unstable situation. 
Amidst these challenges, Emperor Baldwin sought to assert his authority by leading military campaigns to secure Latin control over the surrounding regions. In early August, Baldwin launched an expedition into Thrace, a region that had been contested by both the Byzantines and the Bulgarians. The goal was to reinforce Latin positions and demonstrate the strength of the new empire. However, these efforts were met with mixed success. While Baldwin's forces were able to achieve some tactical victories, they were also stretched thin, and the resistance from local populations and rival forces made it difficult to secure lasting control. By the end of August 1204, the Latin Empire was beginning to show signs of strain. The challenges of governing a vast and fragmented territory, combined with the ongoing threats from Byzantine successor states and the Bulgarian Empire, were placing immense pressure on Baldwin and his Latin rulers. The internal divisions among the Crusader leaders further complicated efforts to stabilize the empire. As summer turned to autumn, the future of the Latin Empire remained uncertain. The initial euphoria of victory and conquest had given way to the harsh realities of governance and defense. The Latin rulers, who had once seemed poised to establish a new era of Western dominance in the Eastern Mediterranean, were now struggling to maintain their hold on a region that was rapidly slipping out of their control. The events of July and August 1204 were a stark reminder that the legacy of the Fourth Crusade would be one of conflict, division, and ongoing struggle, rather than the unity and triumph that the Crusaders had initially envisioned. As September and October 1204 unfolded, the Latin Empire of Constantinople continued to face mounting challenges. The initial months of conquest and consolidation had given way to a more difficult reality, as the new rulers struggled to maintain control over their territories in the face of internal dissent, external threats, and the persistent resistance of the Byzantine population. In September, Emperor Baldwin I focused on reinforcing the Latin Empire's defenses, particularly in the areas surrounding Constantinople. The city itself, still recovering from the sack and the subsequent occupation, remained vulnerable. The Latin rulers were acutely aware that their control over Constantinople was far from secure. The city's walls, though formidable, were not enough to protect it from the ongoing threats posed by both external enemies and internal unrest. One of the most pressing concerns was the continued threat from the Bulgarian Empire under Tsar Kaloyan. Throughout September, Kaloyan intensified his raids into Latin-held territories, particularly in Thrace. These raids were not only a military threat but also a psychological one as they demonstrated the Latin Empire's inability to secure its borders. Kaloyan's forces, skilled in guerrilla tactics, struck quickly and retreated before the Latin forces could mount an effective response. The Latin Empire, already stretched thin, found it increasingly difficult to defend its territories against these persistent incursions. Meanwhile, in the regions of Nicaea, Epirus, and Trebizond, the Byzantine successor states continued to consolidate their power. The leaders of these states, many of whom were members of the Byzantine aristocracy who had fled Constantinople, were determined to restore the Byzantine Empire. In Nicaea, Theodora Lascaris, a prominent Byzantine noble, had established a strong base of power and was actively working to expand his influence. The despot of Epirus, under the leadership of Michael Icominos Daukas, also emerged as a significant center of resistance. These states were not only securing their territories, but also engaging in diplomatic efforts to gain support from other Christian powers, further complicating the Latin Empire's position. As October arrived, the internal divisions within the Latin leadership became more pronounced. The initial unity that had brought the Crusaders together was beginning to fracture. 
Disputes over territory, titles, and authority led to growing tensions among the Latin lords. These disputes were exacerbated by the Venetians' focus on securing their commercial interests, which often clashed with the territorial ambitions of other Latin rulers. The lack of a cohesive strategy for governing the newly conquered lands weakened the Latin Empire's ability to respond effectively to the numerous challenges it faced. Emperor Baldwin I, aware of the growing instability, attempted to assert his authority by leading another military campaign, this time targeting regions that were slipping out of Latin control. In mid-October, Baldwin led a force into the interior of Thrace, hoping to re-establish Latin dominance in the region. However, the campaign was met with stiff resistance from both local populations and Bulgarian forces. The terrain of Thrace, with its rugged mountains and dense forests, made it difficult for the Latin forces to achieve a decisive victory. Baldwin's campaign, though intended to demonstrate strength, instead highlighted the limitations of the Latin Empire's military capabilities. Within Constantinople, the situation remained tense. The Latin rulers, despite their efforts to impose order, struggled to win the loyalty of the Byzantine population. The imposition of Latin customs and religious practices further alienated the Orthodox Christian majority who viewed the Latin rulers as foreign occupiers. The resentment boiled beneath the surface, manifesting in acts of sabotage, resistance, and occasional violence against the Latin authorities. The Latin clergy, who had been brought in to replace the Byzantine Orthodox priests, faced hostility from the local population, further deepening the cultural and religious divide. As October drew to a close, the Latin Empire found itself in a precarious position. The initial success of the Fourth Crusade had quickly turned into a complex and ongoing struggle to maintain control over a vast and divided territory. The threats from external forces, such as the Bulgarians and the Byzantine successor states, were compounded by the internal divisions among the Latin lords and the persistent resistance of the Byzantine people. Emperor Baldwin I, despite his efforts to stabilize the empire, was increasingly facing the reality that the Latin empire was far from secure. The events of September and October 1204 underscored the fragility of the Latin Empire. What had begun as a bold and ambitious conquest was now unraveling into a series of crises that threatened to undo the achievements of the Crusaders. The future of the Latin Empire remained uncertain as its leaders grappled with the challenges of governing a region that was rife with conflict, division, and resistance. The legacy of the Fourth Crusade was becoming one of ongoing struggle and instability, rather than the triumphant establishment of a new Christian empire in the East. As November and December 1204 unfolded, the Latin Empire of Constantinople continued to confront the harsh realities of maintaining control over a fractured and volatile region. The initial momentum of the Fourth Crusade had dissipated, and the Latin rulers were now entrenched in a struggle to preserve their fragile grip on the territories they had claimed. In November, the Latin Empire faced escalating external threats, particularly from the Bulgarian Empire. Tsar Kaloyan, emboldened by his earlier successes, launched a series of more aggressive campaigns against the Latin-held territories in Thrace. These attacks were marked by their ferocity and strategic precision. Kaloyan's forces, well versed in the art of guerrilla warfare, continued to harass the Latin armies, striking at vulnerable points and then retreating into the mountains before the crusaders could mount an effective counterattack. The Latin forces, already stretched thin across a vast and hostile region, struggled to defend their territories against these relentless raids. Emperor Baldwin I, 
who had personally led several military campaigns in an attempt to stabilize the situation, found himself increasingly frustrated by the inability to secure lasting victories. The Bulgarians were not the only external threat. The Byzantine successor states, particularly the Empire of Nicaea under Theodora Lascaris, were also growing stronger and more organized. These states were becoming formidable centers of resistance, each with its own ambitions to restore the Byzantine Empire. Meanwhile, within the Latin Empire, the internal divisions among the Crusader leaders continued to deepen. The initial camaraderie that had driven the Crusaders to victory in Constantinople had eroded, replaced by rivalries and disputes over land, titles, and power. The Venetians, under the leadership of Doge Enrico Dandolo, were focused on securing their commercial interests and maintaining control over key ports and trade routes. This focus on economic gain often put them at odds with other Latin lords who were more concerned with consolidating territorial control. These internal conflicts were exacerbated by the Latin Empire's lack of a coherent administrative structure. The newly installed Latin rulers were unfamiliar with the complexities of governing such a diverse and culturally rich region, and their attempts to impose Western European feudal structures on the Byzantine territories often met with resistance. The Byzantine population, still reeling from the sack of Constantinople, harbored deep resentment toward their new rulers. The imposition of Latin religious practices only deepened the cultural divide, leading to increased tensions between the Orthodox Christian majority and the Latin clergy. By December 1204, the situation in Constantinople had become increasingly precarious. The city's infrastructure, severely damaged during the sack, had not been fully restored, and the Latin rulers struggled to maintain basic order. The Byzantine populace, many of whom had lost their homes and livelihoods in the sack, continued to resist Latin rule in various ways, from passive disobedience to outright acts of sabotage. In an attempt to address these challenges, Emperor Baldwin I convened a council of Latin leaders in Constantinople in mid-December. The goal was to find a way to unify the Latin leadership and address the growing threats to the empire. However, the council quickly devolved into arguments over territory, authority, and resources. The Venetians insisted on their right to control key trade routes, while other Latin lords demanded more autonomy in their respective regions. The lack of consensus only further highlighted the fragility of the Latin Empire's leadership. As the year drew to a close, Emperor Baldwin I faced the grim reality that the Latin Empire was in a state of crisis. The external threats from Bulgaria and the Byzantine successor states showed no signs of abating and the internal divisions among the Latin rulers were becoming more pronounced. The empire, still in its infancy, was struggling to hold itself together against overwhelming odds. The events of November and December 1204 were a clear indication that the Latin Empire was on the brink of collapse. The initial triumph of the Fourth Crusade had given way to a series of crises that threatened to undo all that the Crusaders had achieved. The Latin rulers, who had once envisioned themselves as the new masters of the Eastern Mediterranean, were now fighting for survival in a region that seemed increasingly hostile to their presence. As winter set in, the future of the Latin Empire remained deeply uncertain. The promise of a new Christian empire in the East, born out of the conquest of Constantinople, was rapidly fading, replaced by the harsh realities of a fractured and unstable region. The legacy of the Fourth Crusade was becoming more conflict, division, and the ongoing struggle to maintain control over a city and an empire that had once been the heart of the Byzantine world. As January and February 1205 unfolded, the situation in the Latin Empire of Constantinople grew increasingly dire. 
the challenges that had plagued the Empire throughout the previous year were now reaching a critical point, with both internal and external pressures threatening to unravel the fragile state created in the wake of the Fourth Crusade. In January 1205, Emperor Baldwinai and his Latin rulers were grappling with the reality that their hold over Constantinople and its surrounding territories was slipping. The external threats, particularly from the Bulgarian Empire and the Byzantine successor states, continued to intensify. Tsar Kalayan of Bulgaria, emboldened by his earlier successes, launched a full-scale offensive against the Latin territories in Thrace. These attacks were no longer just raids, they were coordinated military campaigns aimed at driving the Latin forces out of the region entirely. The Latin forces, already stretched thin, were unable to mount a cohesive defense. Baldwin's attempts to rally his troops and lead a counteroffensive were hampered by the harsh winter conditions and the fragmented nature of his army. The Latin lords, many of whom were more concerned with securing their own domains than with defending the broader empire, offered only limited support. The lack of unity among the Latin leadership severely weakened their ability to respond effectively to the Bulgarian threat. In addition to the external military pressures, the Latin Empire faced growing internal unrest. The Byzantine population of Constantinople, who had never fully accepted Latin rule, became increasingly hostile. The harsh winter exacerbated the already dire conditions within the city, as food shortages and economic hardship led to widespread discontent. The Latin rulers, who had struggled to impose their authority on a deeply resistant populace, found themselves facing more frequent acts of sabotage and resistance. The cultural and religious divide between the Latin rulers and the Orthodox Christian majority only deepened the tensions. By mid-January, the situation had become so critical that Baldwin called for reinforcements from the Western European powers. He sent urgent messages to the Pope and to the kings of France and England, pleading for additional troops and resources to help secure the Latin Empire. However, the response was slow and largely inadequate. The crusading spirit that had driven the Fourth Crusade had waned, and the Western European powers were preoccupied with their own conflicts and concerns. As a result, Baldwin received only a fraction of the support he had hoped for. As February began, the external pressure on the Latin Empire continued to mount. Tsar Kalayan's forces achieved several significant victories in Thrace, capturing key fortresses and driving the Latin forces back toward Constantinople. The success of the Bulgarian campaigns sent shockwaves through the Latin Empire, further demoralizing the already beleaguered Latin forces. Meanwhile, in the regions controlled by the Byzantine successor states, the leaders of Nicaea, Epirus, and Trebizond continued to consolidate their power. These states, each led by members of the Byzantine aristocracy, were becoming increasingly organized and formidable. They began to forge alliances with other regional powers, further isolating the Latin Empire. The prospect of a coordinated Byzantine effort to reclaim Constantinople became a growing concern for Baldwin and his advisors. In Constantinople itself, the situation reached a breaking point. The ongoing food shortages and economic difficulties led to riots and uprisings within the city. The Latin rulers, already struggling to maintain order, were forced to impose martial law in an attempt to quell the unrest. However, these measures only fueled further resentment among the Byzantine population who saw the Latin rulers as oppressive and illegitimate. As February 1205 drew to a close, the Latin Empire was on the brink of collapse. The external military threats from Bulgaria and the Byzantine successor states combined with the internal unrest in Constantinople, 
created a perfect storm that the Latin rulers were increasingly unable to withstand. Emperor Baldwini, once a triumphant leader who had been crowned in the Hagia Sophia, now faced the very real possibility that his empire would not survive the year. The events of January and February 1205 were a stark reminder of the challenges faced by the Latin Empire. The initial successes of the Fourth Crusade had given way to a protracted and seemingly unwinnable struggle to maintain control over a region that was deeply hostile to Latin rule. The Latin Empire, which had once seemed poised to become a new center of Western power in the Eastern Mediterranean, was now teetering on the edge of disaster. As winter turned to spring, the future of the Latin Empire remained deeply uncertain. The once great city of Constantinople, now under Latin occupation, was a city under siege, both from within and without. The legacy of the Fourth Crusade was becoming one of unfulfilled promises, shattered dreams, and the relentless struggle to hold onto a fragile empire in a land that was slipping through the Crusaders' grasp. The Fourth Crusade, which had begun with lofty ambitions to reclaim the Holy Land, ultimately ended in a series of unforeseen consequences that would reshape the medieval world. The most significant and lasting result of the Crusade was the sack of Constantinople in 1204, an event that marked a turning point in the history of the Byzantine Empire and Christendom as a whole. The establishment of the Latin Empire in the wake of the sack was intended to create a new Western Christian stronghold in the Eastern Mediterranean. However, from the outset, the Latin Empire was plagued by deep-seated problems. The division of the Byzantine Empire among the Crusader leaders, the Venetians, and the various Latin lords created a fragmented and unstable political landscape. The imposition of Latin rule over a largely hostile Byzantine population only exacerbated the challenges of governance. Externally, the Latin Empire faced relentless pressure from neighboring powers, particularly the Bulgarian Empire under Tsar Kaloyan and the Byzantine successor states of Nicaea, Epirus, and Trebizond. These states, led by Byzantine nobles determined to restore their empire, continuously chipped away at the territories held by the Latin rulers. The Bulgarians, in particular, inflicted significant military defeats on the Latin forces, further weakening their hold on the region. Internally, the Latin Empire struggled to maintain unity among its leaders. The initial cooperation that had brought the Crusaders to victory quickly dissolved into disputes over land, titles, and authority. The Venetians, focused on securing their commercial interests, often found themselves at odds with the other Latin rulers. This lack of cohesion only served to further undermine the stability of the empire. The Latin Empire's inability to establish a strong, centralized government and to secure the loyalty of the local Byzantine population ultimately led to its decline. The empire that had been established with such high hopes in 1204 was, by the early 13th century, a shadow of its intended self, beset by enemies on all sides and weakened by internal divisions. The Fourth Crusade's diversion to Constantinople and the subsequent establishment of the Latin Empire also had far-reaching consequences for the Byzantine Empire. Although the Byzantines eventually regained control of Constantinople in 1261 under the leadership of the Nicene Emperor Michael E. Palaiologos, the empire was never able to fully recover from the devastation of 1204. The Byzantine Empire, once a dominant power in the eastern Mediterranean, became a diminished state, vulnerable to the rising threat of the Ottoman Turks. The sack of Constantinople also deepened the divide between the Eastern Orthodox and Western Roman Catholic churches, a schism that remains to this day. The events of the Fourth Crusade sowed lasting resentment between the two branches of Christianity, undermining any efforts at reconciliation. In the end, 
The Fourth Crusade stands as a cautionary tale of how ambition, greed, and a lack of clear objectives can lead to unintended and often disastrous consequences. What began as a holy mission to reclaim Jerusalem ended in the conquest and devastation of one of Christendom's greatest cities, leaving a legacy of division and conflict that would echo through the centuries. Thank you for joining me in exploring the complex and often tragic story of the Fourth Crusade. I hope this account has provided insight into the far-reaching impacts of these events on both the medieval world and the history of the Byzantine Empire. Stay tuned for our next exploration into the Second Crusade, where we will continue to delve into the fascinating and turbulent history of the Crusades.